that responsibility for some reason. Well, you know, I mean, how do you come to this path? Yeah. No worries. So is he uh, lighting off the mic from the camera? Just a regular Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to decrease the number of the camera. All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Wow, much quicker than my classes normally are for quieting down. Thank you for that. Uh, so, we are all here this afternoon uh, for Darren's thesis. Uh, we also have uh, uh, some people joining us uh, live stream. Uh, we couldn't be here. Uh, for some unfortunate reasons, uh, and that's also why it's a little bit dark in the back. So don't take it as a an opportunity to fall asleep, but knowing how exciting Darren's work is, it's gonna keep you awake. It certainly has kept me awake over the last week. <laughs> um, but uh, we are here to uh, basically see the, the final result on Darren's, uh, I would say, passion project, uh, where he undertook a completely different thesis topic that I gave to him, and after supervising him for a few weeks, I kind of realized that his passions lie somewhere else. Gave him the opportunity to take that over as a project, and uh, he went with it, and he's going to present the results of that work today. So the floor is yours, Darren. 30-minute uh, presentation, then you guys ask questions. Make sure you ask good questions, because he gets graded on how he answers those as well. Uh, and then we take them away, and then we answer the really tough questions, put the thumb screws on. Uh, and an hour after that, we'll come back here for the, the diploma signing. So, with that, take it away, Darren. Thank you, Calvin. Okay, well, firstly, welcome, uh, and, and thank you all for, for being here. It means a lot that, that you're here. I, I'm very passionate about this project. Uh, I think it was a huge amount of fun. So my topic for the day, Bird Bones to Honeycombs. So it wasn't actually the title of my thesis, but it's a bit of a sexier one. So hopefully, uh, yeah you'll have, uh, have as much fun with uh, the presentation as I did with the topic, that's the idea. So this is actually what I found. So cellular solids are highly sensitive to their nodal topologies. Now I think some engineers in the room will kind of have an inkling of what this might be about, but even then it's a little bit specific. Um, and actually that's the, the uh, idea of the presentation is to give you a good overview of all of these things and, and so that you can kind of walk out of here having some appreciation for, for what I've done. So um, we're going to be looking at patterns in nature, trying to figure out how it is that they work, how to apply them in a bit of a smart way for uh, new designs, and then get to uh, better, more, better, more performant structures. And that performance, as you'll see, has a, a few different definitions. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about it. So, um, and, and I should add, um, these things are, are being discussed at the moment because of new manufacturing technologies like additive layer manufacturing, or as you might know it, 3D printing. So. This is the program for today. Um, so quite a classic program, I would say. I'm going to focus a little bit on the big picture, really try and underline why it's so important to be looking at these things. Um, then I'm, you'll, you'll spare the theatrics, I hope. We're going to go for a forest walk in the room, of course. We'll see how that goes. Um, I'll then commit a little bit of time to defining exactly uh, the scope and all of you know my research. So really, kind of uh, introduce you to the to the topic that I really looked at, and then I'll be looking at the um, cellular solid level tests after the nodal level test. So I've split it up into two different scales, and then what I tried to do is I merged them uh, in a final sort of synthesis. Now. That might be a little bit gobbledygook for some of you, but essentially um, it's an experimental, a series of experimental, uh, experimental investigations on different scales, and I kind of put them together to try and figure out what was really going on. And uh, I'll end with a bit of a so what, so that you kind of think, wow, that was a very academic presentation. Actually, I think there might be some, some really promising potential. So additive layer manufacturing, and this is a very nice uh, structure. As you can see at the top, it was designed by Airbus, I think, um, it may be flying, it's for an aircraft interior, and it's, it, it's a lug, so you have kind of a spinning axle that sits in the circle. And the rest, when I look at it, I think, gosh, this thing grew out of metal. It has this sort of organic look to it. It's not like this boring flat piece anymore. 
Um, and as you might imagine, uh, it's quite lightweight. And the way that that was achieved, this increase in sophistication, um, was with additive manufacturing, um, or 3D printing, as I said earlier. And OK, partly there's some technological enthusiasm involved. We love doing this stuff because it's really cool. But also, there are some very serious um, kind of benefits to this, because you are flying much more lightweight. And um, I'm going to throw a, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how, how good these figures are, but they're from The Economist uh, in, a, in a recent article. And the, the price for a kilogram in, in aviation is anywhere between $1,200 and 13000 So that's quite a large range. And I suppose it depends on exactly what the aircraft is and how you use it. And it is very expensive because every kilogram that you get up there flying uh, burns a heck of a lot of fuel. So this is actually just the fuel cost. Um, and of course, there are other costs too, like environmental costs, um, and not just with you know, CO2 emissions that we all know of, um, but you know, the quality of air and how, how nice it is to breathe. So these are some pretty important aspects that we should consider. So, um, but also, it's, you're using a lot less material. So you're incrementally building up layer by layer material exactly where you need it. And you can do these things that just classically weren't done before because it was so difficult and expenses, uh, expensive using um, older technologies. So cellular solids, what the heck are they? Well, as you might imagine from the name, it's, uh, it comes sort of from biology and our understanding of biology where we have little cells kind of built up in systems to make these structures that you see in the middle. You have cork. And uh, even in aerospace, we actually use this phenomenal material. So I was really surprised when I went to Leiden uh, this summer, and we saw huge boards of cork being wrapped around um, different parts of the spacecraft. And it's being used because it's lightweight. It has amazing uh, thermal insulative properties. It's great for getting you know, dealing with vibrations. So there are all sorts of really nice uh, material aspects that it has. And it's difficult to beat with um, manufactured uh, materials. Um, so you know, it's lightweight. It's impermeable. And um, currently, I would say a lot of the mechanical studies, and I could easily quickly get into hot water with, with this because I want to be specific, but so structures like these, we often compare them in the research, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what's best in compression? You know, which one is it? Which one should we go for? Um, and these are very, very important um, studies, of course, um, but it seemed to me that people were kind of ignoring the fact that, well, maybe the, the nodal points, and these aren't really arrows showing the nodal points, but they happen to kind of indicate them out. It's the meeting points of the different struts. And I would argue that nodal points haven't really been articulated in their design. They're sort of a byproduct from laying out all of the other struts. And I think that's a little bit of a weakness, and I got obsessed with it. So um, with our mechanical models, such as these, um, as you can see, there's an arrangement of struts in this honeycomb. This is useful because we're going to get back to the structure later. Um, and the meeting point, the, the nodal points, are actually usually, especially in our analytical models, they are condensed down and simplified to a one-dimensional thing. So it's one point. And they have an implicit stiffness. And you, the engineers in the room will see these. We've seen these graphs from year one. Um, you have sort of an end fixity coefficient. So you have a column, and then you, you're either supporting it and not allowing it to twist or, or not. And when we talk about that mathematically, we, call about, we talk about boundary conditions and end fixity. So that's what we do in, in these structures. There are a bunch of struts. We, you know, we, we understand things on the level of struts. And they're connected together one dimensionally with a sort of implied stiffness. But the node itself isn't, you know, isn't really well known to, to a great level of detail. And cellular solids are very interesting because they have this sort of relationship with stress and strain. Again, sorry about all of the graphs. Um, we love them. Um, but essentially, the first bit is what you have with most materials. You, it, and perhaps you know this from secondary school uh, physics experiments. You have um, a spring, and then you uh, put a force on that spring, and you extend it. Um, and it will resist against that extension more and more. So that's the first part of the graph. 
Now, of course, I'm talking about compression here, so think about an inverted spring. It's, a, it's an energy absorber, a bit of a cushion. So as cellular solids start to collapse and fold in on itself, we get to what's called the stress plateau, and then you're just kind of busy crushing the structure, and it kind of flatlines out. And then it starts to increase again, as you can see at the end of the graph, because there you don't have any more space. Um, there's no more space left to kind of keep deforming the material. So now it's a, pretty much a solid block. And then we have that kind of familiar uh, graph again. So that's really nice because the integral under the curve, that is to say the area under it, represents how much strain energy you can absorb. So especially if you can extend the, the, the plateau length or increase its height, you really get some great returns for energy absorption if that's what you're after. So this brings me to nature now, and hopefully you can walk out and you think, hmm, that's, you know, I recognize that and I, I know what's going on. Um, I, I thought this was really wonderful. So when, when we look at a, a red oak leaf like this, um, actually what we see is that the, the profiles of the leaves are very distinctive and they're common to each other and they're not quite a parabola, they're not quite a circle. In fact, um, there's a guy uh, in, in Germany, uh, Klaus Matek, who has made an approximation to this and he's got like the simple geometric thing which, which allows us to kind of, and it seems to be common in many different natural structures. And what it does is it's stress homogenizing. So here you can see the sort of geometric algorithm of how to do it. So you have a 45 degree or you know isosceles triangle or yes I think so um, and then you kind of cut it in half you take your compass it, you know to use this kind of school analogy you draw it and then you keep doing that and you repeat it and you repeat it and then it has like this nice smooth curve and you see it in all sorts of structures you see it in the leaf here and we also see it in the branch over there and we even see it in the trunk over here. So there's kind of like this, for different layers of the structure or different scales, we, we have this kind of common uh, topology. And, and what it does is it's stress homogenizing. So it gets everything to the same loading. Um, and, and that's really good because that's good uh, material uh, usage in terms of um, its ability to absorb um, energy over its uh, length. But also, and this is quite surprising, and to me, this makes it truly track fractal. You have it at forest boundary profiles. So the shape of forests as they meet a field, for example, will also have these structures. So that's quite amazing. And actually, if you look at stag antlers, there as well, you have these structures in the horns, or not the horns, but the, the antlers of the stag, which is quite amazing. And even, I've added some rocks here, um, some rocks which are eroded by water in, in a stream bed also start to take on this form. So some inorganic, um, structures as well as some organic structures. That's, that's pretty impressive. But we probably shouldn't just copy paste our solutions without understanding what's going on. And so that's what I really focused on in my experiments. So here I'd also like to um, identify what um, the, really what the discrepancy is. So here we have a cape vulture, um, the inside of a cape vulture long bone. So something like uh, my forearm, uh, but then bird version. And on the inside, it, it's not like, it, it, it's very odd. We don't have these structures in, in our bones, but birds have these um, supporting structures on the inside. And as you can see, they're also quite filleted. If, if we see these as a nodal junction, well, actually, they're, they're filleted. So you kind of think, like, all right, there, there might be something in the idea of exploring nodes a little bit more. We, we've sort of been ignoring it for some time. And here are some representations of the types of structures that we make currently. And as you can see, they're quite uh, tight. Um, they're quite you know, right angled and, and, and sharp. And uh, they don't have these smooth topologies. <coughs> ah, I am nervous. OK, so the sensitivity of cellular solids is what I really wanted to look at. So I've got a cellular solid structure. How sensitive is it to changes in nodal topology? Now, as you can imagine, that's kind of a, an unbounded question, so it needs, some it needs to be more concise. And that's what I did with my objective and the scope. So what I wanted to do, also because it's really missing in, in, in the research, is provide real experiments. So no finite element models, 
I have to be honest, it's also just my preference, so that's part of the reason why I did it. Um, and, and really try and gain new insights with things that are grounded in experiments. Um, and the scope of this was to kind of condense it down and focus on a structure that we all know, which is bees honeycomb, and try and figure out, as I change the filleting of those junctions, how, how sensitive it is to, to mechanical change, so how it changes under loading. And of course, I, I did it quasi-statically, so the engineers in the room will understand what that means, which to the layman, or yeah, to a more general way of saying it is you compress it and quite slowly. So it's always kind of in equilibrium, and, and it isn't being loaded dynamically, because then we're talking about slightly different material physics. So the, the way I approached this was I split it up into three different kind of zones. I looked at nodes, in, try and get an intimate understanding of, of the nodal surface, see exactly how it's changing and why, so that hopefully I could spot something uh, when I jumped up to the cellular solid level. And that's what you see in the middle. We've got our honeycomb uh, picture. But these are actual photographs of the experiments. Um, and then hopefully I was going to be able to see some commonalities between the different um, zones and synthesize it together, find a pattern, and try and figure out what's going on generally. And of course, there's a limit to, to the extent by which I can do that. So what's nice about uh, 3D printing is that we can actually, these are actually the models that I printed. They're virtual models, but it's them. So um, I put this into the printer, it printed. You get a good idea of how they are. And I've got, on the nodal level, two versions. So one which is kind of a reservoir. That's my name for it. And the reason I call it a reservoir is that I understood a lot of this stuff as if stress flows through material. So when you put a force on a, on a structure like this, stress develops in the material. And how I understand it is that it flows through the rest of the structure. And it can flow through a pipe with a lot of turbulence. And you know, it's messy, and it's you know, not terribly efficient, and it's not smooth, it's not streamlined. Or it can flow through nice and smoothly, like in a river, and just, or you know, uh, obviously a river can also have turbulence, but um, through a gentle winding stream. Um, and as you can see for both sets, and that one's a little bit more realistic, it approaches somewhat more of a cellular solid to give me some additional clues. Um, um, I, I looked at four different uh, fillet geometries. So I have the unfilleted, I call it the baseline case, because this is basically what we're doing with all of our structures, and that's just a, uh, a very discrete kind of angle. Then I have the circular one, and you have just a single radius, as if I got a compass and transcribed it, and, and there you go, there's your fillet geometry. Matex curve, that's what we saw earlier with the forest, and Bowd's curve, which is actually modeled af uh, from oil flow, which is frictionless, flowing from a hole in the bottom of a pan. So you have like a, a big kind of r reservoir of, of oil, you put a hole through it, and then the, the flow, the shape that that flow takes on uh, is Bowd's curve, and that's the one uh, at the right, so it's like this hyperbolic uh, function with a logarithm in it, it was horrible. So um, this is kind of what the experiment was, so here I, I constrain it, uh, and I had a, a setup to, to do this uh, very well, and then I put a point for us at the end, um, and then I had a look and saw how the, the stress kind of flowed through the material. And at this point you might ask me, well, how? You, you just look at it and you could figure out exactly what was going on on the surface? Well, not quite. Um, and actually, this area right here is the really complex area. So in beam structures, we have a, a sort of pattern of flow that we kind of actually assume and, and something that we can observe uh, quite accurately. But in that nodal area where it joins to the rest of the material, it's doing some pretty funky stuff, and it's quite complicated. So um, this is the, the part that I uh, concentrated on because, well, this is, this is the nodal region. And so this is what the pictures looked like. I had a stereoscopic setup, so two cameras pointed at the uh, model, which was being loaded. And its surface was painted with a random speckle pattern. And then uh, with the help of a computer, I was able to map the changes in the position of the dots and, and how they uh, strained, how they enlarged, how they twisted, and then kind of interpret those as a flow map or, or a heat map. So you could also look at this as a temperature thing if, if you're so inclined uh, to get a good idea of what was going on. But I didn't just have it on the front facing one. I also looked at it from the top. So that's why I had two views. So four cameras in total 
measuring what was going on. So I think I managed to create myself about a terabyte and a half of data, which honestly, you don't always have to be such a technological enthusiast. <laughs> so what, what did I get at? Well, I don't want to agonize over the graphs too much, but the stiffnesses <coughs> definitely changed. Now, unfortunately, the bowed um, uh, fillet uh, managed to rotate <coughs> in its specimen, and I didn't catch it at the time. That was unfortunate. Um, but you can see that the blue line, which is our baseline, the right-angled one, the circle gave a, a pretty good performance boost, and actually that's where engineers tend to stop. We're like, ah, we put a circle in it. We did a good job. Um, but actually, as you can see, if you do something a little bit more nature-inspired, it seems to take on like a very significant increase in stiffness. So that was pretty cool. And then on the finite node, yeah, some of the patterns were a little bit different, but the general trend was the same. So we had first the baseline, and then the slight improvement to the circular fillet, and then uh, an even more improved uh, kind of uh, performances for the flow-inspired and nature-inspired um, designs. And if we want to really understand what the stiffnesses were, here they are on a bar chart. But um, as you can see, it's almost like 40% increase in, in stiffness, which is maybe a touch more. So that was pretty good. And this has been, this accounts for the material that I use. So I get the performance divided by the amount of material in terms of volume that I used. And here's a sort of more comparable graph or, or a step towards what might be more comparable. So, and, and these are the kind of fancy flow patterns. And this is what I really, really, really uh, liked. And it's a little bit uh, difficult to explain exactly what I see. Um, but in the top, in the first row, which is the unfilled baselines for both uh, nodal types, you can see that the flow is quite interrupted. It's ugly. It's not streamlined at all. Um, so you know, we we assume uh, liquid to take the shape of its container. So we kind of expect something to flow around the corner. And as you might see with especially the Matek curve, you can see that those colors kind of start to elongate and change with the overall geometry. And that shows that it's flowing around the corner better. It's better at absorbing these loads in this complicated area. So what happens here is our material starts to seize up, kind of, or, or relax, actually. It's kind of uh, depends how you look at it. Um, and, and it starts to suffer really big rotations and displacements. And uh, that's not very efficient, because if you have a little rotation right in, in the center of that node, the rest of the structure will kind of tank pretty quickly. So you have a, a big incentive, I would say, to, to try and stiffen that nodal part as, as much as you can. Um, now, engineers have a pretty useful way to look at this, and we call it stress concentration. So um, what we see, and this is the nodal area, so this is um, right kind of on this line. We see that the stress concentration for the unfilleted one so the blue line is really high, and it kind of gets higher and higher as we approach the actual node. And then it kind of levels out. And as you can see, one is sort of the nominal rate. And, and so everything dies out towards one, more or less. Uh, whereas the circle, you can kind of see it kind of peaks at about 1.2 at about 4.5 millimeters. And then it quickly dies out, because that material that we added there is absorbing the, stuff, the, the stress quite well. But perhaps inefficiently, because when we look at the uh, MATEC curve, we see that the stress really tanks down to zero and never really has a huge peak. Now, it probably isn't doing it optimally. I'm never going to pretend that that's what I'm doing. But you can see that the, the difference is, is, is quite huge, and the stress concentration never really rises above the nominal value. So, and here it is for the finite node. And because there's less material and it has to, the stress has to kind of go through one strut or the other, there's less material around to kind of absorb that. So there we see that the stress peaks seem to go way up. Um, and, you know, but then still the, um, the nature-inspired and fluid-inspired flows really stick to around a nominal level, although you kind of expect one, but... The funny thing about stress concentrations is that it depends on what you take as your reference. But the overall shape is what I'm really uh, interested in. As, and as you can see, um, these two have a more homogeneous stress level. It's more of a flat line than the other two, which have some sort of asymptote towards, towards zero. So 
do these things uh, translate to the cellular solid level? Yes or no? Well, um, yes, they do, so they don't disappear into white noise. Um, I, I actually fully expected to, to crush these cellular solids, and you wouldn't really see much, and maybe it's promising. But actually, to my surprise, it, it really worked. So again, here are the real virtual um, models of uh, my cellular solids, um, which are somewhat arbitrary, but the honeycomb is quite nice because it's something like a foam and we can kind of make, hopefully we can get some broader insights into what's going on. Um, but I can open up on that later in the question room if you like. And these were the results. So I compressed it, as you can see in this diagram. Um, as you might see, I know that they're quite small images, but we're talking about pretty small changes. We saw it earlier in the models too. And so we're talking about you know, adding some material strategically at the nodal points. But what happens is the behavior completely changes. I have to say, I really focus on this uh, level of the chart, um, so, so the low deflection levels, um, because that's where material influence kind of has least of an effect. Um, and so I hope what I wanted to say was I wanted to really um, focus on the form and, and try and divorce myself from the material. But of course, it's kind of impossible to do that. Um, so I, I wouldn't agonize too much about the, the nature of the ends of the graphs, but it's probably some sort of indication from, from what we can expect. So what do we see? We see an increase in stiffness, again, which is quite cool. And of course, as you might expect, the area under, uh, under the curve is, is very different. So if we draw you know, a straight line, the area under this curve is about, I don't know, about half of the area under that curve, right? And so that's really useful for, for energy absorption. Um, I should add, um, and here actually this is quite a nice zoomed up version, I've kind of got icons of the nodal point. So here we have the, the abrupt change. Here, that's a new one. I, I replaced the bad curve because it was so similar to the Matek curve. And I just put a, 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 a lump of mass there. The reason that I did that is I kind of imagined, or maybe I had a nightmare, I'm not really sure, with someone saying, hey, um, no, um, no crap. Um, you added material and the stress went down. You know, okay, fair enough. But it matters how you, you you put it there. You want it to be streamlined. You want it to be, you know, not just an ugly lump which actually has a terrible, um, which which causes terrible stress concentrations. And so here you can see that there there is indeed sort of an identifiable pattern um, with the stiffnesses in that the the stiffness of the uh, matex fillets is is much higher and the circular fillets are um, somewhat comparable. As you can see, they're, they're pretty much um, super, like, uh, superimposed on each other quite, quite well. Whereas the unfilleted node and, and the uh, lumped node uh, have a much less of a stiffness. What was also interesting was to actually, I, I know I said that I, I concentrated mostly on, on the, first, uh, uh, the first part of the graph, and I would say that's what my discussion was focused on. But what, I, what I couldn't help but notice was that here we can see that the material fractures right at the nodal point. So right at the nodal point, we have a fracture that initiated and um, you know, a fragment was made. Whereas with the circular and matek ones, you can quite distinctly see that the breaks have happened um, in the strut itself. And that's quite nice, because if you have a node that breaks, well, you, that crack is pretty close to the other attachments to the strut. So you might lose you know, three struts if one node fails. Whereas if it breaks in the strut, um, in the uh, fluid versions, well, a strut breaks, but your node might still be intact. And so that's kind of what I believed I saw on, on these different scales. And what was interesting is that the lumped node also had a fracture right at the nodal point where we had, where the circle comes down and meets at a right angle with the, um, with the rest of the strut. It fractured there as well. So there were some commonalities that I couldn't help but find, find very interesting. So the lessons learned. Uh, how do we synthesize this? Well, as I mentioned, the initial deflection rigidities changed, and that changed across scales. So with our unfilleted versions, they were the least stiff, uh, and the um, filleted versions were the most stiff. Um, on the nodal level, I saw that stress homogenization was occurring with the better designs. So it had an improved flow around that corner. Um, the, on the cellular solid level, I saw some interesting fractures, and that's what I just discussed. So together, I thought that was uh, really quite promising, and that's what I had my discussion on. So what, you might be saying? Well, 
we're probably quite far off until we're really getting um, into you know, uh, a really well-defined application. But I think the knowledge is there to really start thinking about um, increasing the specific stiffness of some structures. So that's to say, how much stiffness for how much mass of that structure? You could see it as a sort of stiffness, stiffness efficiency. That's very useful for aerospace and other lightweight applications and the increase in energy absorption. So I think uh, already the Apollo 11 had a honeycomb structure on its feet to absorb the landing impact. Uh, maybe we can make even better um, kind of energy absorption feet for, for future aircraft. Also, the sensitivity, as you saw, there are some pretty wild changes that I think happen mostly because of the changes in the nodal areas. That means that we can use nodal grading throughout the structure to achieve you know, targeted stiffnesses, or really try and um, tell the structure how to behave. Um, and I think, so I think that high sensitivity can be used not just to increase stiffness, but to have it, you know, perform in, in, in kind of more advanced or uh, uh, more intricate ways. And then I also think there's some structural health monitoring potential. Why do I think this? What is structural health monitoring? Well, um, our latest structures, um, you can kind of think of Internet of Things, I suppose, um, have like all sorts of sensors that can be um, laid on top and um, in fact I used a sensor during my experiment which were, were the cameras and I couldn't quite see what was happening in the corner itself. I got pretty close but the corner wasn't really observable because it was casting shadows and it's a line and you kind of need a surface for a f photograph. Um, whereas with the filleted versions, well it's a nice smooth surface so you can observe it. You can also glue a strain gauge on there, you can do a whole bunch of things. So there are some added advantages there, I think, as well, for structural health. OK, what about things? Maybe things are more tangible. Well, I think um, bio-inspired frame gens would be very interesting. So sometimes we have these wonderful lightweight kind of rods and other components that we can't really attach together very well. So it would be very interesting to do that. I had a conversation about that with uh, Otto. Um, we can also implement them into even better crush and crumple zones. So you're probably aware of the fact that our cars are very safe these days. And there are parts of the structure that are dedicated to absorbing strain energy safely so that it doesn't go into the passenger. So ideally, you'd like to wreck the material around the passenger cabin, and the car is wrecked, but you're safe. Um, so it'd be very interesting to do it not just on a structural level, so uh, you know a shape that we can see, but the material that makes up that shape as well. That'd be really interesting too, because we'd probably make it more lightweight. Maybe we can absorb some more energy. Maybe we can save some people. Uh, and then, of course, there's the problem of conformal lattices. Earlier, I, I talked about the models that we currently have. And basically, we do a study on the unit cell, so the constituent level, and then we see how that behaves. And then we kind of blow it up um, onto like a, a um, kind of uh, a multiplied uh, structure. So we have loads of different unit cells acting as a, as a system. And hopefully they should behave you know, in a way that we'd expect from how they behave on the small scale. But actually, at the edges, the edges aren't supported like the ones in the middle. And that's a bit of a realistic problem. And I think that's where the sensitivity of the stiffness can maybe play a role and help sort of even out the, that kind of funky warping at the edges. That'd be kind of an interesting thing to research for. And then, of course, smart structures. I talked about structural health monitoring. So it would be very interesting if we could get towards those things. Research recommendations. What, what do I think, uh, we, where do, do I think we should go from here? Well, I'm not going to get too specific, I, but I, I'd like to see dynamic tests. So I did quasi-isotropic, quasi no, sorry, quasi-static tests. So, you know, really load it slowly and, and gradually. It'd be really interesting to see how the nodal designs affect sudden loadings. So does the speed of um, sound in a material change for changes in fillet geometries? This would be very interesting for, I suppose, military applications, but also the crash structures that I mentioned earlier. That's the sort of loading that we're talking about. So we have to do some work before we can actually make them. And um, the sort of, how, how do we do filleting for three-dimensional cells? I did it for a honeycomb, quite straightforward. It was a two-dimensional shape. But how do we do it with you know, kind of like a diamond structure, which has struts kind of pointing out of a node at 3D? How do you, how do you fill up that? What's, what's your reference frame? I think it would be an interesting mathematical topic to, to visit.
And then, of course, there's um, the stretch-dominated um, lattice. I, I didn't go into this too much, but I looked at a bending-dominated lattice structure. So the honeycomb is, I would say, mostly uh, bending-dominated. So it'd be very interesting to see, okay, what are the uh, increases in performance for stretch-dominated lattice? So something like a, a triangular repeating structure, like what we see in, um, in truss bridges and things like that. Um, also, functional grading. Uh, can we kind of make some sort of design tool or decision-making tool to really get targeted um, mechanical performances by grading the, the nodal filleting across the whole structure? Um, if so, you know, what would that look like? Because that's, I think, where I started. I was thinking about doing, um, or, or Calvin introduced me to the, the idea of looking at cellular or solid triggers. So how can we trigger specific damage? And actually, I kind of went full circle. Maybe you knew this already. But I went full circle and realized, well, that's kind of actually the very interesting part. Because you could say, if you took my research as far as you could, you'd end up with some sort of material utopia. Everything is loaded equally. Brilliant. We're very efficient. OK, where is it going to break? I have no idea. Or you, know, you have a little a bit of damage, and then suddenly the whole thing implodes. That, that's not very smart design, actually. So actually, figuring out how to have a predictive, safe failure in a way that's controlled, that's where the real strength lies on top of my research. So I'm not you know, discounting my research in any way, but I think that's, you know, it would be very interesting to examine this further. Uh, and perhaps we can even get towards something like a structural fuse. So perhaps you're all familiar with the seismograph that measures earthquakes and the Earth's vibration. but you know, wouldn't it be cool, and I know this is kind of getting sci-fi-y uh, pretty quickly, but wouldn't it be cool if you could have a strut where we've managed to focus a lot of the, um, the strain in there or to have different types of strain that we can then recognize so that it kind of logs the, the sort of structural response, um, yeah, the response of, of the structure through its lifetime. That would be quite useful too. And I think that brings me to the end of my presentation, so thank you very much. Now, we open the floor to you for questions on uh, what he presented. Why did you choose to continue with Mathix curve instead of Bounce curve? Because it seemed in the graphs that you showed that Bounce curve was more efficient. Yes, that's true. Um, I liked Mathix. Well, firstly, thank you for the question. I like Mathix curve because it kind of goes against what we think of Phil it is, which is like this smooth profile. And I was seeing massive increase in performance with just you know, straight lines. Um, but at that level, which I was printing for the cellular solids, um, I already saw, because uh, I tested the other two first, just so that the practical side of this, I noticed that the difference between a circular one and a Matek one was already pretty limited. Um, and so I was questioning. Uh, it, it, it's, it's good that you asked this, actually, because I was, limited, I was questioning the precision of what I planned to print versus what I actually printed. And at that level, I didn't think there was any utility in, in making you know, a smooth version. I, I just went with Matex curve. And then I, you know, there's a limit of time that you can put into this sort of stuff, so I just kind of drew a line under it. Uh, but I added that sort of uh, mass distribution to answer, or to hopefully answer a different kind of question, which is you increase the material and you, know, you got better stress response. Yeah, OK. But with the, the lumped node, I was able to see, well, it really matters the shape of, of that note. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions? Just got to be other questions. Go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like if you, you, discuss, if you mentioned it already, already, you look at the like bending dominated structures. But do you also expect similar behavior for uh, a stretch dominated structures, or is there going to be a difference in the importance of nodal geometry between the two? Well, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, th I think the, the long and short of it is that I, I'm not 100% sure how it would change. But what I do know is that the stress has to flow through it somehow. And there's a load path that connects you know, the top of the structure to the bottom of the structure, ideally. So if you can have a better shape of load path, a more direct route, I imagine that you'd see some sort of gain. But I'm not sure. I can't speak as to the, up to the, as to the sensitivity of, of what that would be. So. Ralph? Interesting uh, topic, uh, Darren, and uh, thank you for sharing it. Nice presentation.
presentation. Compliments uh, for that. Uh, you may be focused on the static testing. Uh, yes. Do you have ideas about uh, the dynamic uh, effects of um, the different, different shapes? Well, this was a uh, preliminary investigation uh, on the on the um, on the static level. Probably we can do some more advanced or some more um, specific research in that area already. Um, but I, I don't see why not you why you couldn't do uh, you know use similar structures for dynamic tests. Now I'm not a dynamic test specialist. I don't really know um, if you're limited in your geometry and everything, so you might have to tweak it a bit. But um, I would say it would be great to take a stab at this on the dynamic level, but I, I'm not 100% sure how to approach it. I'd have to research it more. Thank you. Jan, yeah. In what extent could you use finite element uh, for the uh, mathematics for, for uh, predicting what is uh, going to happen? Thank you for the question. Um, I actually decided not to have a numerical component to my research. I think it would have been very interesting to have a better view of which parameters cause what change. Um, but I, I, I just simply didn't do any finite element modeling. So. Would it be possible to do it, or do we have to develop the models first uh, based on your research? <laughs> well, perhaps, perhaps it's a training set. I'm, 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 I, I think you'd probably have to repeat the experiments a few more times to make sure um, as to you know how good that set would be for validation, but back to the the finite element modeling aspect of the question, um, I think it's very tough to to really have a finite element model that captures a sharp discontinuity. That's something that's very difficult to capture in a computer model, I would say. Um, but it, I, I think a finite element model could shed some very specific light if you have very specific questions for example, on the nature of, of a curved structure. Um, but I'm definitely not a finite element uh, specialist, so I only have a, you know, uh, I only have a basic understanding of it. So. Thanks. How do you deal with uh, the inaccuracies in the 3D printing? Like you said, they're both pretty similar. How do you know that the, uh, your input is actually your output, the exact shape? That's a, that's a really good question. So um, it's worth saying that I didn't validate this. I wasn't able to scan it in and compare it to my model. Um, I did some uh, simple things like checking the strut thicknesses with calipers and compare that to, to what I thought I was printing, and it was quite accurate. Um, and I have to say that the, um, the Formlabs Form 2 printer that I was using, I was printing most of the structures, I think, at 25 or 50 microns. So we're talking pretty small increments. and. A lot of my research, um, the experiments were really built on the assumption that within a series, all of the specimens are really comparable. So that they were fabricated in a similar orientation, so it has a similar relationship with um, resolution, let's say, um, similar materials, and, and of course I, I kept the post-processing the same. Um, it's also worth mentioning that I don't think there are any major difference, uh, major reasons to think that there's a lot of residual stress that changed according to different um, topologies. So, but, but there are assumptions that I'm making and, and had this been a PhD I would have loved to kind of dive deeper and verify those assumptions. I, I hope that kind of ask, answers your question. Well, I didn't, I didn't validate it is, is the long and short of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, so I used gray resin. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a proprietary uh, material that we have a data sheet on, but we don't know intimately what it is. It's a photo, um, I forget, it's a photo active uh, resin. So you have um, a liquid resin, and you have a platform, a build platform that sits in it, and the laser kind of cures the resin onto the build plate, and then it kind of prints gradually, uh, going layer by layer. So. It, it's um, yeah, it's a photoactive uh, resin, and it has uh, the property that it's uh, elastic and brittle. So it's basically elastic, like a lot of other materials. And then, okay, there's probably some plus, some uh, short plasticity effects at the end, but then it it fractures and it fails. Um, and as I said earlier, I was really focused on the uh, linear elastic scale. So I was looking at beam deflections that were about one percent, and what that means in sort of 
real terms is my uh, hands, my um, uh, arm span, wingspan, yeah, wingspan, um, is about one meter eighty from you know finger to finger, and so that represents about a two centimeter kind of change, and that's what I was looking at when I was looking at the um, the, the strain map. Um, it was that sort of deflection, so really quite quite small. If, if that helps answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the bar graphs that I produced, um, I, I didn't think, sorry? They were already, already mass specific. They were normalized according actually to the planned volume that I printed with. Okay. Yeah. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, great. Maybe one more question? Okay. Last question? Some time ago, you were uh, we were talking together. You mentioned that you were testing uh, yourself as well. Was that part of this experiment, or uh, testing on myself? Or did I understand it wrongly? Uh, I, I I performed these tests myself. Yes. Yeah, I know. And I also uh, I suppose I could also I, I might as well say um, I also developed sort of the CAD software. So I programmed all this stuff in MATLAB, and out came an STL file which I printed directly. So you not test your own bones on it first. Oh, no, I didn't test myself on it. The next experiment. Sure. <laughs> no, testing the student is a supervisor's job. <laughs> and, um, we do that on a daily basis. And uh, speaking of testing the candidate, the committee will now be taking him to another room and uh, testing him thoroughly for the next <laughs> hour. Uh, normally, uh, it's quarter two, so probably in about an hour and a half, from now will be around that time period. I'm sure you can send out messengers to gather sure. people. Uh, after uh, we have our discussion and, and question and are satisfied with his answers, uh, then we will assess him, grade him, and come back here. And if all goes well, we'll be signing a diploma. Um, or otherwise, I have a box of tissues in my office, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> but I have never seen those needed, so I'm not too worried. So. Uh, Let's thank Darren all one more time and thanks. Uh, meeting with one. Do you have the key? I'll grab it and then just meet us up there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's true. To some extent, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was really fascinated. Really so, no, it was brilliant. Yeah, no, no, very nice to see Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you went uh, very well. Thank you. Oh, I didn't see you before, so uh, thank you for coming. I came in the way I